When I started my YouTube channel, it was for the express purpose of having a platform to publish my video podcast series, Behind the Grind. Now we have come to the point where this is the final episode of season one, and I've reserved this spot for a very special person. I hope that in this series so far, I've been able to tell stories that not only inspire, but make you feel connected. My intention with Behind the Grind was to dig into the stories of everyday entrepreneurs to reveal that we really had more in common than we thought, that every single one of us trying to make a success story happen. We're just human beings. We run on virtues like grit, perseverance, determination, and hard work, but we also experience human experiences such as failure, rejection, false starts, etc. Our next guest has a career that reads like something out of a movie script. His name is Tyson Hepburn, and I am so proud that I'm able to call him a friend. But despite being friends prior to asking him to being a guest on the show, I had not known the depth of his career history. If you were to meet Tyson in an informal space, you would probably just think that here was a down-to-earth, happy-go-lucky guy. And while this is true, Tyson is also one of the brightest talents in the unscripted television production space. He is the co-founder and executive producer of Mayhem Entertainment and holds the distinction of being the youngest person ever to have created a hit series on the Discovery Channel. Tyson's show, Cold Water Cowboys, premiered at the third highest ratings ever for a Discovery Channel premiere. One of his most recent projects, Rust Valley Restorers, airs in over 160 countries worldwide and has a huge cult following online. Rust Valley Restorers was recently nominated for a Canadian Screen Award for Best Direction. There's a chapter within a story that I want to make a special mention of in my introduction, and that is the story of his friendship with John Driftmeyer, his best friend and business partner. John passed away in 2013 while filming the show Dangerous Flights, and John had a brilliant legacy of his own, something that Tyson's going to talk to us about. So depending on who you are and what your individual unique background is, you're gonna have different takeaways from this episode. But for me, my biggest takeaway was the idea that fearlessness is more like an ideology than anything that we are born with. Depending on your background, you're gonna come away from this episode with various different takeaways. For me, my biggest takeaway from Tyson's interview was learning that fearlessness was more akin to an ideology than it is anything that we are born with. Fearlessness is more like a commitment to be renewed every single day through the choices that we make moment to moment. Without further ado, welcome Tyson Hepburn to the show. Hey, so I have Tyson Hepburn with me. Welcome Tyson. Hi, thanks for having me on the show. I didn't want to give too much away about you and your career in my intro because I feel like this is like the bulk, the meat of what makes this interview interesting. And I know that because we already had a run through. So before I get ahead of myself, do you want to maybe let the viewers in on sort of who you are? Yeah. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Um, <clears throat> My name is Tyson Hepburn. I'm the co-founder of Mayhem Entertainment. We produce uh, unscripted um, reality and documentary programs for Netflix, for History Channel, for Discovery Channel, and for Amazon Prime. Okay. Did you grow up here? Yeah, I grew up uh, here in, I grew up in White Rock and then I spent the last 10, 12 years in Vancouver. Did you go to school here? I went to Simon Fraser University. I got a bachelor's in uh, film and television. Okay, so did you always know that you wanted to go into film production? Yeah, 100%. I always wanted to be in movies and television. I never knew I was going to be in the unscripted space, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I always thought I was going to be a movie director or something. Um, but, um, yeah, pretty, pretty quickly I realized that uh, un unscripted documentaries um, there's something really special about getting a chance to um, kind of uh, drop into somebody's life, into a business you know nothing about, and to really kind of uh, delve in and kind of learn everything there is to know about that business, mm -hmm. learn everything there is to know about that person, what makes them special, what makes them tick, 
what makes that business, um, uh, you know, what or what are the challenges uh, that uh, make that business uh, worthy of being on a TV show? Right. Is this something? Th so take me back to when you were at SFU Film School. Mm -hmm. Did you know then that you were going to go into the unscripted space? The first time I realized I wanted to go get into the unscripted space was when I uh, met uh, my um, business partner at the time, uh, John Driftmeyer. So he was kind of already uh, dabbling uh, and, and working in that field, and he got my, my first job uh, working on uh, an unscripted documentary series called Monster Moves, um, which was an engineering show about uh, elevating houses uh, mm -hmm. and actually moving big buildings around. Right. So when was this? Had out of, just out of university? This is just out of university. I so graduated is... and literally uh, within a week I was on a plane to Nova Scotia to move some submarines around actually. That was my first job. It was crazy. Right. That was nice. That was really nice of John to hook you up with a job right out of university. He was a great guy, you know. I mean that's this the film and TV business, it's really, it, you know, it's a, uh, it's, um, what's the word? Um, it's, uh, what's some, it's a stereotype to say, but it's not what you know, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it's absolutely true for, for film and TV business. It's, right. it's really all about the connections you make. And I, I've made some good ones over the year and, and John was definitely one of them. Didn't he just graduate a year ahead of you or something? <clears throat> Yeah, he had a he managed to uh, talk himself into this really amazing job. Yeah. Uh, and and he got me um, he got me on the show as well. So I'll forever be grateful for him for that. Okay, so tell me about Monster Moves. So this is your first real job out of college. How long did you spend working on this this show? I worked on the show for about eight months, I think, um, and then uh, two thousand eight hit. Um, economic collapse, uh, n there was no jobs in film and TV. Um, so I was kind of stuck, I had no money, I had uh, you know, no job, uh, and I really had to kind of start figuring things out uh, for myself. And that's kind of where my entrepreneurial spirit kind of took hold. Mm -hmm. What was John doing during this time, or had you guys sort of split up? Uh, he was doing his thing, he, he managed to kind of, uh, uh, he had a job on another uh, show. Mm -hmm. So he was, he was working away uh, on that show and I was just kind of struggling trying to figure out uh, my path and in, in, uh, in my career. And how long did this period last before your next opportunity? Well, uh, yeah, so after the economic collapse, 2010, uh, I had an amazing opportunity to film during the Olympics. And uh, it was going to be a great job. I was going to get to kind of follow, uh, film some sports during the Olympics, f film some competitions. Uh, I was really excited about that. Um, and literally like a week before the Olympics was mm -hmm. going to start, uh, they called and uh, somebody else got the job or something happened. The job got canceled. I don't even really remember. Yeah. But basically here I am again, no job uh, and uh, and two weeks of the Olympics. Yeah. Yeah, it sucks. Okay. Then what? <laughs> so then I uh, managed to meet a contact who was, uh, uh, he was basically a contractor. He was a pyro, it was a pyrotechnic company mm -hmm. that had got the contract to do the fireworks for the Vancouver 2010 Olympics. Right. And I said, oh, that, you know what? That'd be a cool way to, something to put on my demo reel, you know? Yeah. I wasn't even thinking at that point it would be a TV show. I was thinking, this is maybe an opportunity to make a cool demo reel because fireworks are beautiful, they're great. This will be neat. Yeah. Uh, I managed to talk myself onto the pyro barge, uh, got the security clearances, which took a long time to do. So what is a pyro barge? A, py a pyro barge is... Basically, if they're setting off fireworks in a lot of cities, um, mm -hmm. including Vancouver, they'll set them off um, in, uh, they, they try to set it up so they're setting them off uh, in the water. So it's like a control center? 
Yeah, it's it's a barge. So it's the barge where they basically set up all the fireworks and they shoot off all the oh, fireworks off the beach right. so that they can have a crowd on the beach yeah. and you can look off and you can see all the fireworks, you know, in the middle of the ocean. The yachts can come mm -hmm. uh, and, and watch the fireworks kind of happen. So you were there capturing footage mm -hmm. for your demo reel. Mm -hmm. And then what? Yeah, so it was a crazy experience. Being on a pyro barge is like... Uh, it's akin to being like in a, in a war zone, you know, there's like uh, firework fallout uh, going all over the place. It's hot, it's crazy, mm -hmm. it's dangerous. Um, it's, it's perfect fodder for a reality show. Um, we, I set up a bunch of cameras. I, I followed this crazy um, French uh, pyrotechnic crew mm -hmm. and I made this amazing, uh, what I thought was just going to be uh, kind of like a, a highlight tape to, to take to producers. Uh, I finished it. I showed it to John. Uh, and John said, wow, you know what? We should, we should pitch this as a TV show. This is, this is something special, you know? So I said, sure. You know, I went along with it. Why don't we try to pitch it as a TV show? Not really thinking anything of it at the time. Uh, and we pitched it to a film production company here in town. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know what? Maybe we can make this into a TV show. And so, uh, yeah, it was about a year of development, and we got a green light to make Pyros, uh, the TV show. So that production company ended up pitching it to... Discovery Channel. Discovery Channel. Mm -hmm. And then once it was accepted, then that was when you knew, okay, we, we have the green light. This is going to be a fully funded project. We can now make this a show. Yeah. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. Uh, it's basically Pyro's uh, every episode mm -hmm. um, features a new country, a new fireworks display. Um, so literally, we traveled to all kinds of exotic destinations. And uh, usually when, you, when you're setting off fireworks, it's going to be a big party. It's going to be a celebration for, you know, for a country's, you know, we're, we're going to do, we did the jazz festival. We did, um, we did a fireworks competition in Berlin. We did um, Carnival in Brazil. It's a celebration of a country's, uh, what do I want to say here? It's a celebration. It's a competition. It's, uh, it, it's a reason to have a big party, you know? So we got to... I uh, go to some amazing destinations that I'd never been to, mm -hmm. and uh, it was probably one of the, one of the best experiences of my career. It was so much fun. Yeah, not bad for somebody who just over a year ago was jobless. Mm hmm. So, yeah, it's it's amazing how fast life can change. You know, yeah, exactly. From good to bad, and from bad to good. So, how long did you end up working on Pyro? We did Pyros for two years. So we traveled the countries. We are. We did Pyros for two years. We traveled the globe, globe trotted for two years with that show. Um, I was, my passport uh, was filled up with stamps by the end mm -hmm. of that show. It was amazing. So then after season two, did it just not get renewed for a third season? Yeah, it got canceled. Okay. So the show got canceled. It wasn't a big hit, but it was, it was enough to say, to you know have some credits on my resume, have a few more bucks in my pocket, and you know, be ready for uh, the next adventure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what, what was the next adventure? So I'm trying to picture, you're telling me a story. I'm now picturing two seasons in to Pyros. Mm -hmm. You are, what, the creator? Mm -hmm. You've just found out that it wouldn't get, the show's not getting renewed. It's, it's gotten canceled. What are your next steps? Were you stressed about having to figure out what to do next at this point? It was definitely like, you know, um, that's the thing with, uh, with, with TV and movies and Hollywood in general, you know, you're, it's a boom and bust business. So you're either on top of the world when you're in production, you got lots of money coming in, uh, you're, you're, you're doing your craft or you're, you're bust, you know, you're, 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 you're spending money, you're in development, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're trying to think of what's going to be the next thing that's going to be bigger and better and really capture people's imagination and, and, and get those uh, viewers watching your show. Right. So by the time Pyros wrapped up, had you, did you know what your next steps were going to be? Me and my business partner decided that, uh, we were going to go to New Orleans. Um, 
the uh, so yeah so the um, the star of the engineering show that mm -hmm. I first worked on, mm -hmm. he kind of made a name for himself in New Orleans mm -hmm. uh, as a uh, supporting character on a previous on the previous show that we had done, and he was doing a really really interesting project in New Orleans. Um, the TV show was called Jacked or House Jackers. Mm -hmm. So who is this guy? He, what does he do? He is a larger than life character that uh, uh, raised up uh, buildings mm -hmm. uh, and moved them around. Okay, was he, and he wasn't doing this on the engineering show? He was, yeah. Oh, okay, so now he wants his own show. Yeah, so um, basically um, he wanted to do uh, his own show. He wanted his business uh, to be the star of the show. Um, because uh, TV's a great uh, form of advertising, right? Mm -hmm. So he basically helped fund the whole thing. So uh, we went down there on his nickel, um, and he basically helped... Uh, was he a big shot on the previous show, the engineering show? What was it called again? Monster Moves. Monster Moves. So Monster Moves. This guy, what's his name? Jeremy Patterson. Jeremy Patterson. Um, on Monster Moves... Tell me about his role in, Mo in Monster Moves and then tell me about his role in this new show. Like, To go from a supporting character on Monster Moves to now the main producer guy who wants you and John to come along to create this. What happened? Like, How did he so go he, from A to B? Okay, so yeah. So basically, um, in New Orleans at the time, um, uh, Hurricane Katrina... This is post Hurricane Katrina. So the Federal Emergency Management Agency uh, gave out a uh, billion dollars worth of funding to help raise up New Orleans above the flood lines. Mm -hmm. So if you had water during Katrina, mm -hmm. you got a federal grant from the government, a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollar grant from the government to elevate your house four feet above the flood lines. Right. So um, if you got water during Katrina, if your house had been flooded, you got this grant. Right. And uh, Jeremy ended up being, uh, or his, uh, this engineer, uh, his company ended up being one of the uh, companies that got um, hundreds of these grants. So his company was making millions of dollars a year. And he, but he, and he always wanted to be uh, the star of his own show. Right. So, and partially he landed on people's radar because of monster moves, monster yeah. moves. Because of the show he would previously done, yeah. That's so cool. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now he wants you and John to come to New Orleans. What's your role in this new show? So again, we were gonna create uh, a really uh, amazing show for him. Um, he funded the whole development period of the production, um, which ended up being expensive and and uh, and we ended up making just an amazing demo reel with them um, you know all about the dangers um, and the risks mm -hmm. of raising houses up you know it's a really dangerous profession um, people can get injured people can get killed when you're when you're taking a, a 500 ton house and basically elevating it right? right so we followed the engineering challenges the danger um, and and just some of the um, and the great culture of New Orleans, um, really interesting project. So you produced the demo reel, did, and you did you have to pitch it to a, a, a network? So again, uh, same as Pyros, we pitched it to a production company, a Canadian production company, okay. and so again they took the reins, um, and they. Um, uh, they basically pitched it to Discovery Channel, so we were kind of uh, minor partners in the project. Um, and yeah, and then that's that's kind of like how the show got made. So how many seasons did One Jack season. Oh, okay. Just one? That was all we got, yeah. Some shows work out, you know, and, and, and some shows through execution or... You know, there, there's so many reasons why shows are successful, and there's just as many reasons why they fail. Right. Um, and it's hard to put your finger on just one reason why. Yeah, because from the way that you were describing it to me, I was like, oh, dang, like this sounds like a really exciting premise. I'm mm -hmm. surprised that it only lasted one season. Mm -hmm. So, you were, how long did it take you in total to film this in New Orleans? I lived in New Orleans for six months. 
Okay. Um, again, a, a great place to live, amazing culture, great people, um, so much fun. Um, and even though the show itself wasn't as successful as I wanted it to be, um, the experience um, was amazing. And again, I got a credit on my resume. Yeah. Um, I was a bit disappointed that it didn't go further, but uh, what do you do? You move on. Okay. So take me back then. You, you've just found out that uh, Jacked isn't getting renewed. You and John are now tasked with having to figure out the next opportunity. A, do you have a clue as to what that opportunity is at this point? And B, what did you end up doing next? Yeah, so back to the drawing board, you <laughs> know? Um, and so, yeah, it's, we're back to the drawing board. And this time we decided to take a look at, okay, what are the trends in TV, you know? Uh, what's, what's a big hit show um, on, say, a Discovery Channel, you know? And, and the biggest show on Discovery at the time, and I think it might still be, is and was Deadliest Catch, mm -hmm. which is, as everyone knows, it's one of the most successful uh, shows on Discovery Channel. And it's an amazing show about Alaskan uh, fishermen, uh, crab fishermen. Uh, and the ratings on that show were huge. And so we said, huh, I wonder if we can do that with the Canadian fishing industry. Um, and from there we decided to go to Newfoundland because uh, as everyone knows, there's just an amazing culture in Newfoundland. They have a deep, deep history um, with fishing. They basically, you know, they say they got salt water in their, in their veins, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, so on our own dollar, uh, we literally flew to Newfoundland um, <clears throat> and we just started going to these little fishing villages, uh, talking to people and uh, finding out who the kind of legendary um, fishing captains were in town and, and, uh, and started to develop our next reel. So to the viewers watching, I just want to make sure we're painting this picture. People might not know exactly where Newfoundland is. We are here now in Vancouver. Newfoundland is an entire country away. You can't even get a direct flight there. So you flew. So did John, did John go with you? Yeah, we went together. Okay, so you guys flew yourselves from Vancouver to Newfoundland just to see who would talk to you there? Yeah, it's one of these things, I mean, like, sometimes in research and development, you can pick up the phone. Sometimes you really got to go and kind of um, ingrain yourself in the culture. We, yeah, we went to Newfoundland. Uh, we got really ingrained in the culture. And, uh, yeah, we started meeting really awesome, legendary fishermen. And, and then I, for whatever reason, John went home. I got stuck on actually hopping on one of the fishing boats mm -hmm. and, uh, and heading off to the Grand Banks, 150 miles offshore what for for your demo reel for the demo reel and you have all of your equipment with you mm-hmm paint this picture for me yeah so the so <laughs> yeah so basically the first time uh, we met a fisherman mm -hmm. and he says yes I want to have you guys on our boat um, I'd love to have you on but we're not going this week we're gonna go in two weeks right okay. so I went home and then he calls me like three or four days later and he says, we got to go right now. So you got to fly back. So I dropped everything, fly to Newfoundland and I get there and I call him and he'd already left on his boat because the shrimp fishery was closing. So he'd already left. Okay. And he said, I'm gone, but my friend is coming out into the same area where I'm fishing. You can hop on his boat and uh, there's a chance that uh, you can come out there and we can do a ocean transfer. So you be on his boat, you'll put a survival suit on, you can jump in the ice cold water and I'll pull you over to my boat with my crew and then you can be on my boat and film with me. It was the craziest idea, super dangerous, should have never done it, but we were desperate at this point. We'd already mm. spent you know, $10,000 on plane tickets. And so yeah. we said, let's, let's give it a shot. So yeah, so I went on, I was, went on the other guy's boat, the friend's boat. Um, we were kind of filming on that boat a little bit too, you know, he wasn't really that much of a character. His fishing was kind of boring. Um, but we got out to the, 
it's called the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. It's a famous fishing area where uh, 150 miles offshore. So literally it takes a full 24 hours to get there. So you get on the boat and you're just heading off into the abyss. Right. And, um, and yeah, we got out there and uh, it, was a, it was like a, a full moon. So the ocean was totally calm. The boats kind of were within 20 feet of each other. I put this big survival suit on and uh, I hopped in the water and they pulled me across and then we're really worried about the equipment. We bagged up the equipment in these big garbage bags and we hauled all the equipment across. Oh my God. That sounds terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, it was a little scary. John was worried about me. I was worried. I'm worried for your equipment at this point in the story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The equipment all made it across. Nothing got wet, you know, uh, which is great. And then, uh, yeah, and then we ended up filming, uh, we ended up filming an amazing demo reel, which turned out to be Cold Water Cowboys, our, our third show and our, our, and our biggest hit to that point. Okay. So I feel like I kind of understand this process now of filming a demo reel and then pitching it. So you've, you went out to Newfoundland, you have your demo reel. Who did you pitch it to? The production company or directly to the network? So again, we were gonna, so basically, so this time we actually, so this is a guy I can talk about. So, so this time uh, we actually partnered with um, an amazing producer here in town, David Paperni. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a legendary Vancouver based uh, producer since retired. He uh, was nominated for an Academy Award. Um, we'd what? always, what's that? In what? For documentary, for documentary oh. he did. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so he'd been nominated for an Academy Award. Um, like just an absolute legend in the business. Uh, and we always wanted to work with him. So uh, we went and we pitched him uh, the demo reel. He absolutely loved it. He always wanted to do a fishing show. He always wanted to do a show with Discovery Channel. And so we partnered with them and uh, it was, uh, this was in February, 2013. We partnered with them on the show. Uh, at, and then by the end of the month, um, uh, John passed away tragically. I know we've chatted about this story before, but I don't know why every time you mention John's passing, it just, I feel like I'm hearing it again for the first time. Yeah. What happened? Yeah, it was, it was a, it was tragic. It was just a huge shock um, to the whole industry. Um, I mean, everybody in the business uh, heard about it. It was uh, big news. You know, the Hollywood Reporter um, uh, reported on it. The Globe and Mail reported on it. Um, it John knew everyone, and he was a he was a really special guy. Um, and so uh, he, you know, he was he touched a lot of people. And so you know, um, you know, very, 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 very shocking. One of the, hopefully, one of the biggest shocks in my life. Right. So can you tell the listeners what happened? Wasn't John working on a show? Yeah, so in between our two shows, we were both working um, on another show that we had not created, um, that we were just kind of hired guns on, and it was called Dangerous Flights, ironically enough. And the show was all about uh, aircraft delivery. Um, again, a, a dangerous show, um, but a really exciting adventure as well. Um, the two seem to kind of be hand in hand, you know, danger adventure excitement um, and so basically the premise of the show was if you are here in Vancouver you buy an airplane on Amazon uh, but the airplane is in Africa or Germany uh, these two pilots will go over there they'll hop in the airplane and they'll fly the plane all the way back uh, unlike a commercial flight which takes 12 hours to get you know across the world mm -hmm. this literally will take Two, up, you know, up to two or three weeks to get a plane home. You're flying a few hours a day. You kind of hop from country to country. Right. Um, sometimes they have to actually change the airplane itself, right. add fuel tanks, um, uh, uh, do other modifications to the airplane in order to get it to uh, fly these long distances that it's not normally meant to fly. Okay, so this show was called Dangerous Flights. Yeah. And then 
John was producing it. He was filming. Yeah, so John was filming in the airplane. Uh, his air, so his route that he was taking was actually from New Orleans. So John was flying his airplane from New Orleans to Kenya, Africa. Uh, that's where his plane was being delivered. Um, and they actually made it all the way to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the plane landed in Kenya on an animal reserve. And it was, yeah, pretty crazy. So what happens in this part of Africa when you want to land an airplane, you actually have to buzz the runway first to scare all the animals off that might be on the runway. So there might be giraffes or elephants or whatever on the runway. You buzz the runway, scare all the animals off, and then land. That's how it's done in this part of Africa. So they buzz the runway, they landed the airplane, they were all safe. Mm -hmm. The two pilots actually boarded a commercial flight and went home. Mm -hmm. But John, being the perfectionist that he was, uh, never got the kind of shots of the animals kind of like running off the, the runway. And so he hired a local bush pilot mm -hmm. to take him back up in the airplane. And yeah, so he hired a bush pilot and, uh, and they, uh, it was an ultralight, a very small, very small aircraft, uh, two seater. Uh, it looked like a lawnmower turned upside down. It was so small and tiny. And uh, he, they f went back up, and I guess a downdraft uh, hit the plane, uh, and they uh, smashed into the side of Mount Kenya. Uh, actually, a, a goat farmer uh, who was, or no, sorry, a, a sheep farmer who was herding sheep in the area actually saw the plane go down. He witnessed the plane crash, and he was the first one uh, that uh, got to the wreckage. Right. Where were you when you found out the news? I was on another airplane mission uh, in the United States. I was in uh, South Dakota at the time, and I'll never forget it. It was the most shocking phone call of my life. The, another producer called me, and he said, Tyson, are you sitting down? And obviously, you never want to hear that. And I said, yeah, I'm sitting down. And he said, and he said uh, John's, John's dead. John's passed away. He, he crashed in the airplane, and he's and he's dead. It was very shocking. It was, you know, I hope I never have to go through that again. It was very tragic. You're in South Dakota. You're on another airplane mission. Mm -hmm. You're seated. You find, you hear the news. What were the next couple days for you like? I mean, I remember the next moment. I, I almost had like an outer body experience. And you throw the phone down and you just start screaming and crying. And I could see myself above myself like you're kind of like you know um i can't even explain it you you don't even you're not even in your own body it's so traumatic and uh yeah it was it was a very yeah traumatic time i uh uh i immediately went home our project was canceled uh because of what happened obviously um went back to canada and and uh we we came together as a as a family. I, the whole industry came together to support me to support John's uh, um, a widow, um, and it was yeah it was very very sad time for a long time. It was it was tragic. I don't even know how to have this conversation. Whenever grief is involved, and I can't even begin to try to picture what the next few weeks for where you for you were like so you came together with the family with John's widow and then what you still have uh, cold water cowboys it's just gotten the green light for production so how did you deal with a the grief and then be having this this project that John was part of creating and that having the green light for we didn't actually have ahead. the green light so when john passed away it still wasn't green lit and i'll give a lot of credit to david properni again the uh, legendary producer he really um you know it all became you know let's do this for john uh and he was really the force to kind of like help push that project with uh 
Discovery Channel mm -hmm. uh, forward, you know, and, and within a month it was a greenlit show. I'll give him all the credit to, to, for helping, you know, move that project forward. Um, and uh, yeah, it ended up being like an amazing, uh, you know, that was the kind of start of our four year uh, partnership and, and amazing project and uh, um, filming in Newfoundland. Um, Before we get into that, can you briefly just tell the viewers about John Driftmeyer? Who was he? Mm -hmm. What kind of guy was he? Mm -hmm. What's his legacy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, John was a, um, yeah, John was a really, really special guy. He touched a lot of people, very, very smart, um, ahead of his time, very precocious, always, um, always, uh, you know, um, touching people. And uh, yeah, just an amazing person, you know, um, really special. It was really sad. How did you deal with the grief? How did you find it within yourself to work, to start working on this new show? Like what was that, the spark that inspired you? Was it partially for John? Yeah, I think that getting to work on Cold Water Cowboys was, um, was a good way to deal with the grief. It was therapy for me. Um, going back to Newfoundland and finishing this project for him, doing it for him, was was definitely a big part of it you know um so yeah you know like uh we and it was not an easy production to do either you know it was it was tough it was a it was a tough go right so tell the viewers more about cold water cowboys yeah so cold water cowboys is uh um is a fishing show that follows um six captains and their boats um, over the course of a, of a high stakes fishing season mm -hmm. where they fish everything from shrimp to cod to mackerel, herring, uh, capelin and lobster. Um, so we got to kind of follow all these different fisheries uh, basically from April all the way to Christmas. And it premiered it at prem the top spot on yeah. Discovery Channel? Yeah, so actually a year a year after John passed away was the premiere of the show. One year almost to the day, uh, Cold Water Cowboys uh, aired 2014. And it premiered at the top spot. It was one of the highest rated premieres uh, on Discovery Channel uh, at the time. I don't know if it was the top one or not. And how many seasons did this go for? We did four incredible seasons. That's cool. Okay, so after season four, what year is this? This is like two years ago. Two years ago. You have done a lot. You've been through a lot in what seems to be a very short career, which looking back, it's not like the shortest, but a lot has happened. Yeah, I feel like I lived two lifetimes, <laughs> two yeah. careers or three. I'm not struggling to keep up because I'm as you're telling me your story and visualizing all of the events and picturing John and picturing cold water cowboys being out in Newfoundland on the fisheries, mm -hmm. four seasons later, you're probably a, a completely different guy. You probably feel pretty confident mm -hmm. that you have some like a real hit under your belt. Mm -hmm. So four epic seasons later, we're now in the year 2018. I feel like you it deserve might have been a break. 27. It might have been 2017. Okay, 2017, 2018. Do you give yourself a little bit of a break now? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, you know, it's again, it's like uh, you kind of are starting from scratch all over again, right? So, um, you know, you're making some royalty payments off of the new show, so which is nice, and uh, found a new business partner. You know, and uh, and this time, um, unlike the previous times, now we're thinking, okay, we can make a go of this ourselves, right? Paperni had retired. We're not going to team up with a production company. We're going to try to do this ourselves this time. We're going to co-found Mayhem Entertainment, and we're going to start uh, 
a whole new adventure. And this time it's going to be about car restoration. Right. Um, yeah. This time we're not going to partner up with a production company. We wanted to uh, do this ourselves. We wanted to co-found a company and take all the risk ourselves, um, which included actually um, signing our mortgages over to the bank. Um, so, um, you know, if anything were to happen, if the production were to get canceled, um, you know, uh, basically they could take our, take our houses away, right? Yep. It's a big risk. It's collateral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So back to the beginning, what is, right, what is the premise of Rust Valley Restorers? Rust Valley Restorers mm -hmm. follows Mike Hall, uh, eccentric car collector, uh, Avery Schoff, uh, sledgehammer wielding crazy man and Mike's son, Connor, uh, who's the kind of business end of the operation, as they try to restore Mike's collection of 400 classic cars. From old, rusty, decrepit, broke down, um, to shiny and new again. And where's the show? Where can I find it? Uh, so, Rust Valley Restorers airs on History Channel Canada and internationally on Netflix. Okay. Are you, have you filmed season two? Yes, yeah, season two's, yeah, so season two's, um, season two's complete. Okay, so is that sort of the big show that you're working on now? Yeah, so Rust Valley Restorers is by far our biggest hit. Um, we have a huge fan base around the world, uh, and we've got a great um, uh, domestic fan base uh, here in Canada. Um, so, uh, we call some of our hardcore fans Rusties, uh, our Instagram and Facebook accounts are full of them, uh, they're, they're, they're huge fans of the show, they're always clamoring for more episodes, um, they're always, uh, they always send Mike messages, uh, they want to get their own, uh, cars restored, you know, um, when I started that show, you have no idea how uh, how big the car culture is, yeah. and um, and how emotionally connected people are to their cars. You know, um, everybody has that one car. You know, like their their first their first car that they uh, went on their first date in. You know, um, uh, and and it, and it. A car can bring back really uh, special memories for people, um, and it's that emotional attachment that um, that makes these people go crazy, you know. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, and especially with Mike. I mean, Mike's got 400 cars, um, and I remember the first time I met them, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, we went down into his field, and literally, he's collected four 400 um, cars that nobody else. Everyone else would, would kind of uh, cast away and just send to the crusher, you know, send it to the junkyard. Mike pays for them, he buys them, he sees potential in them, and he wants to restore every one of them. The way that you're describing the, the premise for these shows, I would imagine, okay, so based on your description, it makes sense. I'm sitting here, I'm like, obviously this would be a hit. Obviously that would be a hit. Rust Valley really did become a huge hit, but did you know before, before this all came about, did you really have an inkling about how good the show was gonna be? I never knew how big car culture was, you know? Um, uh, it is a beast, you know? There is a lot of, like car people are crazy. And there is a lot of them, you know? Um, and so, uh, and, and everyone kind of has an attachment to their, to a car. They know somebody that's a car person, you know? Right. Um, it's, it's a great subject matter because cars are so relatable. Right. Uh, and everyone's had a great experience in a car. Right. You know? How did you meet the main characters of Rust Valley? So, when I met Mike for the first time, uh, it, it was amazing. I mean, Mike is an absolute encyclopedia of car knowledge. He knows, you know, he'll see, he'll look an old car, he'll know how many of that car were made in the world, he'll know uh, everything there is to know about that car, and he'll probably, by the end of the conversation, he'll probably want to buy it off of you. If it's old, if it's rusty, if it's a piece, of, if it's a POS, 
um, he probably wants it. Especially if it's a uh, Canadian or American classically made muscle car. Um, that's his thing. But he also does imports. We did our first kind of import on the show last year. Yeah. So, yeah, so you got Mike, just an amazing, uh, um, Mike, just this amazing uh, encyclopedia of car knowledge. He knows everything there is to know about cars. He's got this, um, we call it the Field of Dreams, his, his lifelong collection of 400 old junkers. Uh, and then you've got Avery Schoff, who is the mechanical MacGyver. And I remember the first time we met Avery, uh, he's like, we see this, there's like this old kind of rusty engine. And uh, Avery's known as the mechanical MacGyver uh, for a reason. He can get just about anything started. So he says, you know, watch this, guys. And he looks at this engine, tinkers around with it, you know, moves all these things around, sprays some stuff throws a wrench in there, and this engine probably hasn't been started in 35 years. Yeah. And within 20 minutes, he's got it, he's got it going, he's got it running. Unbelievable. So what's next for you in Rust Valley Restorers? Are you looking to produce another show too? Or it sounds like you're pretty, <sighs> you're pretty all in for Rust Valley. Yeah, uh, Rust Valley is a, Incredible show, you know. Uh, I'm looking, always looking for the next one. Um, I'm always excited about um, about this business and uh, you know delving into into new new kind of um, areas, new businesses, you know, and figuring out what what are what's gonna be the next big thing, you know. What what are people gonna want to watch next? What are those subcultures we can really delve into? You know, what's um, or what are these subcultures we're going to delve into and and what's 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 kind of relatable to the general population that's really going to be able to get eyeballs onto the screen you know so i was hoping we could use the time that we have left to address some of the more general questions that somebody watching this who might be interested in business or might be interested in in film production questions that they might have for you question number one what are the things that you look for for when it comes to creating a hit show? What are some elements? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> when you're looking for a hit show, you want to find uh, something that is relatable to the general population. Um, and it's one of these things where it can be a bit tricky, you know, because uh, on the one hand, you've got, so I'll give you an example. Um, airplane shows. There's been one or two hit shows, but overall, airplane shows do not do well on TV. Uh, car shows, there's a ton of car shows. There's a ton of great car shows. Car shows do really well. Uh, and and, and you, you know because you turn on the TV, there's just a lot of car shows because the channels know uh, they want to green light car shows and <clears throat> because they, they, they get a lot of people. Uh, they get big audiences. Why do you think car shows are more popular than airplane shows? Uh, I think that it's because, uh, you know, I mean, look, everyone uh, has an experience on an airplane uh, and they're usually not that great unless you're super wealthy and you've got uh, and you've got your own private jet. Yeah. Your experience in a airport is probably shitty. Right. You know, you've been waiting in lines forever. Uh, you got to you know take your shoes off at security. Yeah. Uh, you you're delayed. You got to sit beside somebody uh, who you don't want to sit beside, and it's just kind of you just want to get to where you're going. Right. Whereas. The relationship that we have with our cars is different. It's more personal. Some people name their cars. Exactly. I got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, and you know, yeah, and it's not so much just getting where you're going. It's the it's the it's the it's enjoying uh, the, the 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 travel itself. You know, it's enjoying the journey. And uh, you know, people. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, you know, people can get emotionally connected to their cars. Uh, so I think that's kind of why. Um, yeah, car shows are popular and, and, uh, and airplane shows aren't. But of right. course you got to combine it with a lot of other big factors like 
really interesting characters. Your career has been one of going from show to show to show to show. Thankfully, you've got a number of really successful titles. Hence, now you've got a big TV production company and the creative freedom to basically pursue whatever projects you want. There have also been shows along the way that haven't been hits. What kind of person do you think it would take to endure a career trajectory like that? Yeah, if you want to be a TV producer, uh, you got to take the good with the bad. Uh, and you, you got to be, uh, for every hit show, you're going to have 10 flops, you know? It's just the way the business is. Uh, and a, uh, I think David Perperny told me, you, gotta, you live for the hits, you know? You get that one hit show, and that kind of funds everything else that you got to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and that's true, you know? Um, you you got to kind of like, uh, you know, ride the wave uh, and, and enjoy the ride. Um, and if there's bumps along the way, you, you just kind of you just kind of roll with the punches and move on. Right. Exactly. That, I, I've been getting that impression from you this entire time that even for something as tragic as losing your best friend and business partner, you did not spend that much time sort of grieving or sulking. Or maybe you grieved in another way. You grieved through work, but you just kept moving. You kept moving after your first flop, you kept moving after your next flop, and then you just kept moving until you got to a point where, looking back, you've got a bunch of hits now. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's always been part of you? Your personality is just fearlessness? Yeah, I think it's an important part of being an entrepreneur, you know? You, you have to be a risk taker. You have to, um, you have to kinda uh, push all your chips in uh, sometimes, you know? Um, yeah, extremely important. So what advice would you have for somebody who's looking to start a business? If you want to be a TV producer, um, yeah, you got to be tough. You got to have thick skin. Um, you got to be, uh, you got to be willing to, um, it's almost like being an actor, you know, you go in for, for 50 editions, you know, and you get a lot of rejections along the way. Uh, but it's those actors that kind of keep going. Um, you know, and, and keep pushing forward uh, and mix it in with like a, t a tiny bit of talent, you know, <laughs> and you'll be successful. Right. So what is that thing that compels you to keep pushing forward? Are you committed to a vision th this entire time and you're just determined never to give up on that vision or what is it? Y yeah, I get, um, yes. You know, I've always been driven. Um, I've always wanted to um, to kind of like uh, um, I've always wanted to make TV. Some people say uh, we're in the TV business. Um, I like to say we're in the transportation business. Um, we help people escape. We take people from one place and you take them somewhere else. You know, you you you, you bring them into a new world that maybe they know nothing about. We co-founded Mayhem Entertainment. And I've got to really give it to Chorus, um, Chorus Entertainment, um, for uh, and History Channel, for giving us the opportunity, taking the risk uh, on Mayhem and our company, uh, and and letting us kind of um, uh, really make the show that we want to make. You mentioned something when we were having a chat before this actual sit down interview that I thought was like. Oh my gosh, it was a light bulb moment for me. I know a lot of people watching are probably wondering, are probably like sitting at the edge of their seat. Maybe like right now, especially with this economic downturn that we're all experiencing, people are probably going to be looking at starting a business. Or at least with, like for the people who've always wanted to start a business, they're probably giving it a second thought now. And if they're asking, when is the right time to start a business? What's your answer? How do you know? Yeah, there's never a right time to start a business. The right time to start a business is when uh, you've kind of uh, shaken off any fear or anxiety um, and, uh, and, and just uh, jump in feet forward and, uh, and know that there's going to be some bumps along the way. Uh, there's going to be some setbacks. And the only thing you can really do is just keep pushing forward. That's great. So when you're not 
you're when you're no longer afraid. And some people are very lucky and they sort of are just naturally, they have that like fearlessness gene and other people might be forced into it via circumstances or they're forced into it when they're called to rise to the occasion. But what, whichever path you take, it sounds to me like the right time to start is when you are ready to take that leap of faith. And I want to end off on that note because that's a really optimistic note. So thank you, Tyson, thank for you, this interview. Joanne. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> wow.